comments about the election campaign and the outcome, and then move on to what I see as the, the broader uh, picture of Germany's position at the moment and its position in Europe. Um, I started as the Economist Berlin Bureau Chief in uh, uh, early March this year, um, when we were in the middle of what was known as the Schultz hype. I thought I was going to be covering a tremendously narrow campaign in which Angela Merkel would potentially be finally uh, removed from office. Um, it looked like Martin Schultz, who was standing as the candidate for the Social Democratic SPD, was uh, neck and neck with the CDU, having uh, surprisingly emerged as its candidate as a former president of the European uh, Parliament uh, early in the year. Uh, that, however, turned out to be a, a flash in the pan, a novelty effect, and what we had in many ways was a very conventional, very stable, very settled German election. Um, Angela Merkel ran under the slogan, Für ein Deutschland, in dem wir gut und gerne leben, for a Germany in which we live uh, well and happily, uh, and was anodyne, I think, to the point almost of parody. Uh, speeches in which she would um, uh, s seemingly negotiate with herself whether she was really on the right or the left. Um, speeches in which she offered uh, pleasant living and a uh, stable government and a, a good economy. And from Mr. Schultz, and I think this is part of the reason why the Schultz effect declined in the way it did, uh, he didn't offer that much excitement either. Uh, it was a very conventional social democratic campaign. He never really seemed to hit on themes that uh, differentiated him from, from Mrs. Merkel, which, as I say, is who is very much on the left of her party. Um, a TV debate between the two of them at the start of September was so harmonious that it was referred to more as a TV duet than a TV duel. Um, we saw at that event two centrist politicians exchanging reasonable comments about the technocratic management of a successful country. And so I think on the surface, to, to look at Germany today is to see uh, and to look at Germany during this election campaign and particularly uh, to look at the contest between the two big German parties, the two parties capable of putting up a chancellor, was to see a country very stable, very settled um, and living well and gladly, as Mrs. Merkel would put it, a country with unemployment, according to the Economist measures, of 3.6%, the fastest growth in six years, the lowest unemployment since reunification. 81%, according to one poll, of Germans feel uh, satisfied, not just with the economic situation generally, but with their personal economic s situation. Exports are booming, and there's a government surplus of about 20 billion euros. All of which might make you think that Germany is a rather boring country today. But one of the things that I discovered having moved out and having started to look a little bit under the surface of things was that it's a very interesting country and one that, um, as I describe in the title of this talk, is in many ways in transition. Under the surface of the satisfied Germany of today, there are tensions. There's a simmering dissatisfaction that expressed itself among other ways, in the success of the Alternative for Germany party, a far-right far party that sprung out of um, opposition to the bailouts um, in 2013 and has since taken a more right-wing anti-Islam, anti-immigrant direction. Moreover, in many of the media, including my own dispatches, uh, the big parties in Germany were criticised for not covering long-term and difficult issues that do in fact face this satisfied and comfortable country. Issues like the integration of refugees, the Germany's future in Europe, which bafflingly barely seemed to appear in the election campaign. Um, Germany's defence responsibilities, the crisis of the German car industry, new competitive industries, new competitive pressures, I mean. And I think this uh, sort of uh, misleading sense of stasis and contentment was borne out in many ways in the result, partly, as I say, by the success of the alternative for Germany, which almost got 13%, which is a, a few points higher than many expected, but also the fact that the CDU and the SPD, the two, the two big parties of centre-right and centre-left, together got their lowest ever joint vote, vote share, um, just 53% down from 67% together in the previous election in 2013. Very striking in particular was the CSU, which is the Christian Social Union, or the sister party, the Bavarian sister party of Mrs. Merkel's CDU, which got just 38% in Bavaria, which is a party of, part of Germany which, where it's usually absolutely dominant. In both cases, the two big parties saw their votes fragment in many directions, going to the Greens, going to the AFD, going to the left, going to the Liberals, going to the non-voter column. And so things are churning in Germany in a way I don't think I anticipated when I moved out to the country. And many of the beneficiaries of this churn were the smaller parties, all four of which uh, saw their vote share go up slightly or a great deal in this election. There's the FDP, a pro-business party, which um, married a Macronish modernism about Germany's future, about the need to digitise, to improve education and infrastructure, with a more populist, more right-leaning um, stance on things like refugees and Europe. They 
uh, came back into the Bundestag after a disastrous election result in 2013. Uh, there's the Greens, who many thought would face a rout at this election, but in fact slightly increased their vote share by making bold, bold uh, commitments to ending uh, petrol-driven cars and to ending the use of coal-fired power plants in Germany. There's Die Linke, which is the descendant of the former East German Communist Party, which um, picked up support particularly in more metropolitan parts of the former West, outside of its bastions in the old east of Germany. And then, as I said, there's the AFD, which fought a very provocative and overtly, in many cases, racist and anti-Islam campaign. Most worryingly, it even came first in one of Germany's states, in Saxony, in the south of the former east. And so the new Bundestag has, is the most fragmented in the history of the Federal Republic, with seven parties in six fractional groups. The CDU and the CSU sit together. Um, German politics is in flux. It's changing. And that's also true of Germany's next government. Um, with the SPD's disastrous result, the party has ruled out joining another so-called grand coalition with Mrs. Merkel. And so the only other um, arithmetically possible coalition given this fragmentation of the Bundestag, is a new three- or four-way coalition, if you count the CSU separately from the CDU, uh, known as Jamaica, because it's the colours of the parties in question match those of the country's flag. Um, so you have the CDU, CSU, the FDP, and the Greens. So a very large ideological spectrum with one, within one coalition. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, what's the rest of the landscape? We have a Merkel somewhat weakened. I think you can overstate the extent to which she was weakened by this result, but... Um, it's worth stating that her party is now just on 30%, which is a very low uh, number for that party. Um, and eyes in the party are turning to the succession. Who will take over from her? There's a battle in some ways between Merkel loyalists and younger members of the CDU who think it should move right, particularly on questions like of identity and immigration. In the CSU, there's crisis. The party's leader, Horst Seehofer, is under challenge from a chap called Markus Zöder, who very much wants to take over from him. And that reduces his negotiating space in these coalition talks. The Greens and the FDP, having done both pretty well, I think expect to see that <coughs> success reflected in the final coalition deal. They want to see their policies reflected. And then you have the AFD entering the Bundestag for the first time and determined to stir things up, to provoke, to wind up the other parties, to... I'm, I, am, I would put money on a walkout of the AFD's MPs at the first thing that they strongly disagree with. And the parties, uh, one of the party's joint candidates in the election even said the morning afterwards that he plans to Jagen Mrs Merkel or hound her down. Um, they're using a, very, a language very unusual in Germany's consensus-oriented and um, uh, usually fairly placid parliamentary politics. What about Jamaica? The talks are currently at an exploratory phase. Then towards the end of this month, uh, the various parties will take them back to, or take the initial agreements back to their parties to see if they can get agreement, um, which looks likely. Uh, then they move on to the final stage, which is actually drawing up the coalition agreement. And it might not be until January that we have a new government in Berlin, which of course has implications for European discussions, European meetings in the interim period, not to mention issues like Brexit. Um, it looks initially like the problem or the difficulty of forming uh, this new Jamaica coalition, which has not existed at a federal level in Germany before, would be in bringing together the FDP, which, as I said, has moved in a more conservative, you might even say nationalist direction in the recent years, and the, and the Greens, which, whose membership goes quite a long way to the left of, the, of, of politics. But as predicted if I may say so, in The Economist, um, the two parties are actually getting on all right. Um, it was always clear that the battles between them during the election campaign were largely for show. And um, I, I, I understand that the leaders, the, one, the two, two main figures in the two parties, actually refer to each other as du, or the informal pronoun, which I think it, it hints at the, uh, the, the, the private level of um, sympathy between the two. No, the problem with, the, with, the, with forming a Jamaica coalition is much more the CSU, which, as I say, has been really beaten back in its uh, home state. There's a state election in the very next year. The party was already pretty upset with Angela Merkel's refugee policies and is going to really uh, want to extract some concessions in, in, in a more um, closed border um, kind of anti-immigrant direction from these talks. So I think that will be one of the major sticking points in the final uh, stages of the coalition talks. Nonetheless, I think there will be a deal. There will be a Jamaica government in Germany. It will work pretty well. The German system is geared up for compromise and um, trade-offs between different parties. And most importantly of all, none of the parties involved want new elections. Although they, they talk a lot about, well, if we don't get what we want, we'll, we'll pull out and force new elections. In practice, they all understand that new elections are most likely to boost the AFD of all the parties. And not to mention the fact that there's also quite a lot of money around to lubricate the wheels of a new deal, which always helps. Um, 
Who will get what? I wouldn't be surprised if the Greens ended up putting up the, the foreign minister, as they did uh, under Gerhard Schroeder, so Cem Özdemir, um, who would be, of course, Germany's first foreign minister of Turkish origin, uh, is, is, I think, a, a, a strong candidate for that position. The FDP have said they want the finance ministry, where I think in many ways they will continue the, the legacy of Wolfgang Schäuble, who has moved to become head of the uh, speaker of the Bundestag. Um, meanwhile, the CSU is likely to, to demand the interior ministry. So that's the government that is likely to take Germany forward from the start of next year. But I also want to use this talk to talk a bit about the sort of country that this Jamaica formation will actually be leading. Um, this is an interesting period of political transition in Germany, fragmentation in the Bundestag, a new sort of government in Berlin. But it's also one of a much broader transition away from what I'm going to refer to as the Heile Welt. Now, for those who don't know this phrase, it's, it's a, it is a phrase referring in German to... It's quite hard to translate. It literally means a healthy or a wholesome world. But it evokes a certain sort of Germany, a certain sort of life in Germany. It evokes a, a Germany of good living, comfortable living, security, stability, of the post-war economic miracle, of, of, of a, a quiet life after the tumult and turbulence and violence of the mid-20th century in Germany. It evokes cultural homogeneity, um, it's, it's, it's the fount of many post-war films and songs. It's, it's, it's a cultural icon, a, a, an image of a Germany rooted in tradition and order, of security and work and life. It perhaps helps to think of it as the perfect Bavarian village set in rolling hills with a beer garden and a church and a well-kept park and a factory with apprentices and people who know their place. And it's a very powerful... Um, I mean, whether or not it's, it's explicitly or consciously referred to as such, that, that vision of the good life is a very, I think, powerful part of the German mentality, the German consciousness. And it's underpinned and driven many of Germany's existing political and economic structures in the past decades. This was a country sheltered under the security umbrella of the United States of NATO. It was, it was that protection that enabled this good living in, 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 in the Heile Welt of Germany. It's a Germany with quite a strong role for the church, with quite traditional social values. It's a Germany that has quite a homogeneous and settled society with stable and relatively egalitarian economic structures, much of what we think of as distinctive about the German industrial model, the apprenticeships, the co-determination in workplaces, the collaborative relationships between unions and bosses, um, the uh, companies owned by generations of the same family, slightly tweaking every so often a, a formula that has worked very well down the years and doing it very well. <coughs> It's also reflected in the German economic model, uh, political model, sorry, uh, the system of consensus of big, uh, relatively centrist Volksparteien or People's Parties, the SPD on the left and the CDU on the right, um, cooperating together to maintain this happy status quo. Now, what I observe in Germany today is not that this high level is disappearing or that it's in many ways becoming any less attractive to the average German voter, but that many of those structural elements that underpin it that I've just described are being challenged or being changed or, or in some sort of evolution. Germany's becoming a much more plural, diverse, and open country. It's in the grip of a series of disruptive changes. The bracing winds of the wider world are making themselves felt more in the comfortable Bavarian village and demanding more of its inhabitants outside of their own country. And I think it, this trend can be described on various fronts. The first is, of course, German society, which is becoming much more fragmented. Germany has traditionally been among the big economies of the West, one of the most egalitarian, and yet wealth inequality has grown there more in the last few years than in almost any other Western country. It's the most, by wealth, now the most unequal country in the Eurozone, believe it or not. 40% of German earners have not seen any real wage increases since the late 1990s. The country's current competitiveness, driven by the, in the view of the economists, very wise reforms of Gerhard Schroeder in the mid-2000s, um, has come slightly at the cost of of, lo of lower wages and stagnant wages for many German workers. I think this, this is very intimately bound up with that simmering dissatisfaction I described earlier in this talk. There's a growing gap that I think many of us in the Anglo-Saxon world are quite familiar with between the successful booming cities and uh, more rural areas and <coughs> small town areas that feel left behind. This, remember, in, in Germany is still quite new and quite different and quite unsettling for many people. This, this opening up of German society is happening in more positive respects. It's becoming a more relaxed and tolerant country. Having been one of the more socially conservative countries in, in Western Europe, it's now introduced gay marriage. It's to those who were there during the rather stuffy coal years, it's a much more free-going, free, free um, easy-going place. The labour market 
for a long time very much geared around the idea of a male breadwinner and a, woman, and a female homemaker is evolving and becoming more open and more gender balanced. Meanwhile, the very meaning of what it is to be German is in, is in, uh, uh, is in flux. It used to be unofficially rather ethnically based. Until the, until the late 1990s, the whole immigration, the legal structure of the immigration system was built around the assumption that most immigrants were people with German forefathers coming from Eastern or Central Europe. That's changed. You only have to look at how the, the shades of, uh, the, 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 of skin colour and the surnames of the German national football team have changed, even in the time of Angela Merkel's uh, chancellorship. If you look back to 2006, when Germany hosted the, um, uh, the World Cup, uh, the German football team, I think, had almost all German surnames. Now it's a, it's a panoply of uh, German surnames, Turkish surnames, Asian surnames. It's becoming a much more melting pot sort of a country, and that's happened very recently, and it challenges many at the foundations of the Federal Republic. Germany's economic model is in flux too. This, this traditional um, uh, model based on the st steady incremental change in certain industries that Germany does very well, car making, machine tools, pharmaceuticals, that still works very well and it's reflected in those impressive statistics I listed at the start of this talk. And at the same time, those are also industries that are going through revolutionary transformations in a way that I don't think they have in, in, in decades. Just think of the car industry, the shift to electric cars, for example, where the German car makers have been rather left behind and have made a very bad bet on diesel engines. Uh, the, the shift to self-driving cars and what that means about the internet infrastructure you need in terms of the, the physical infrastructure you need. Um, manufacturing is increasingly melding together with services, which, is, which are less of a German strength, melding with digital consumption, again, an area where Germany is lagging behind. And so to maintain its strengths in its traditional areas, Germany is going to have to change, I think, in a way it hasn't had to before, in a more radical and, and disruptive way. The very export success of Germany is in question. It's done very well in the last few years by making things better that the rising economies like China either couldn't make themselves or couldn't make as well. Uh, that's increasingly changing. Just look at the state of the, the Chinese car market, the chi Chinese uh, 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 machinery market is becoming much more sophisticated. Um, it's interesting to see that German firms are starting to outsource higher up the value chain. They're outsourcing more high-skilled work. It's not just the, uh, the manual labor of physically connecting parts of machinery, but they're outsourcing quite skilled work now to particularly Central European countries with good education systems and much lower labor costs like the Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, and so forth. The manufacturing share of the German workforce is, is believe it or not, falling, although it remains higher than, than it is in other, in other countries. And indeed, this whole workforce, the, the post-war baby boomers, are about to retire. The largest age segment in Germany is now the 55 to 60-year-olds. This is the next 10 years, a huge number of those who've built Germany's current prosperity are going to retire, and the dependency ratio will change dramatically. In Europe, the Heiler Welt that I described was built on a, on a sort of European integration that was idealistic and very positive, but in which Germany was always mostly able to hold the, nine, hold the line on economic sovereignty. Even with the introduction of the euro, Germany was able to insist on, insist on certain rules, insist, for example, on the fact that the ECB be based in many ways on the Bundesbank. And whether it can continue to hold the line on economic sovereignty within the eurozone is now in question with this bold vision set forward by Emmanuel Macron. Many of Germany's safeguards within the, euro, within the eurozone, within the monetary union, are in question. And it's going to have to come up with some answers to the... Uh, proposals that he made. And then on the world stage, uh, Germany has been traditionally a pacifist power. It's been a peacekeeping power. But its stature and its size and its wealth at the moment are causing, not to mention developments like the election of Donald Trump and his demand that Europeans pay more into NATO and do more for their own security, are demanding things of Germany that the country's politics, I think, are not comfortable with. Um, that means spending more on defence, a subject which is extremely controversial in Germany. That means... Um, integrating with nuclear powers like France. It means deploying German troops into harm's way in a way that hasn't happened in the history of the Federal Republic to date. And then, of course, there's politics, as I've already discussed, uh, the rise of a more antagonistic, less consensus-based, um, more confrontational sort of politics. And so all these different areas, where you look at society, you look at demographics, you look at the economy, you look at foreign policy, you look at Europe, the, the stable, settled Germany that I think many, in which many Germans are living well and happily, is in transformation and demands things of, this, of, of, of those underpinning structures that I think um, will make the next few years probably the most demanding on Germany and its leaders since reunification. <laughs>
And so that's, that's the country which this new sort of government, this Jamaica coalition, takes over. And I think when it does so, it's going to have to take over a country that Mrs. Merkel, in her various, in her three governments to date, has in many ways uh, prepared for these changes, has, has guided into this period of transition, but in some ways has not. On the positive side of the balance sheet, Mrs. Merkel, in her 12 years as Chancellor since 2005, has prepared Germany for its future with things like uh, high levels of research and development spending, a, a strong priority to her as a, a trained scientist by background. She's presided over a more relaxed and modern society. That is partly her doing, I think we can say. For I mean, she may not have driven it always, but she never stood in the way of her social democratic coalition partners when, for example, they wanted to introduce quotas for women on corporate boards, when they wanted to end conscription, when they most recently wanted to introduce gay marriage. She's let that happen. Um, her own leadership style may be bound up with that. Germany has, for the last few chancellors, been governed by very macho, uh, masculine sorts of leaders. You think of Helmut Kohl, you think of Gerhard Schröder, the tub-thumping sort of leadership. Merkel's brought a more subtle and, in some ways, more sophisticated sort of leadership to the chancellery. And I think that that will be a leg one of her legacies, to have changed the tone in which the, chancellorship is ex the power of the chancellorship is exercised. Her refugee gambit, we can discuss the, the merits and the demerits of the way that decision was made and the way the politics of it were handled, but it has speeded Germany on its way towards what they refer to as an Einwanderungsland or, or an immigration country, the sort of country that people move to and integrate into. And it has to be said, although I think the demands on Germany from the world stage do strain its politics, she has presided over a Germany that is doing more in the world already. Uh, she led the push for sanctions on Russia over its intervention in Ukraine, for example. German soldiers are now deployed in Mali, alongside the French, in Afghanistan. Uh, and they are now the framework nation for NATO in Lithuania. Um, German soldiers actually on the border of Russia, well, Kaliningrad, uh, which would have itself been very hard to imagine not so long ago. So Germany is doing more. On the negative side of the balance sheet uh, for Mrs. Merkel... Um, it's certainly true that some of the strategic thinking about the challenges that I've described have been, has, has been absent. Um, under the debt break, which limits government's ability to invest, um, the uh, quality or the value of German infrastructure has actually been falling in net terms since 2012. Germany doesn't spend enough on those still very impressive railway lines and roads and autobahns and, and so forth. Um, there are increasing, uh, there's increasing anecdotal evidence of schools with leaky roofs, of bridges over the Rhine having to be shut, of trains having to be run at slower than uh, optimal speeds uh, because of structural problems on the line. Um, as I say, Germany's still got a very admirable infrastructure, but it's getting worse. And, and for a country that needs to stay competitive, that's, that's a bad thing. The best example of that is the digital infrastructure, where Germany is really a long way behind a lot of Western Europe. It has the 28th fastest internet in, in the uh, world and is behind a lot of countries much poorer and much less economically developed than it. Its services industries are much too over-regulated. Um, Labour market, labor market participation among women is still extremely low for a Western European country. The car industry, as I've already mentioned, is in crisis. It not only put a bad bad bet on diesel engines, but has now been caught up in emissions uh, test cheating scandals um, and seems to be falling behind in an increasing race to, uh, towards electric and self-driving cars, um, notwithstanding its, its formidable competitiveness in the, in the uh, high-end sector nonetheless. Uh, Mrs. Merkel's refugee gambit may have been um, bold, but it was also uh, ambiguous in a, very, in, a, in a fashion very characteristic of her leadership. How long are these people meant to stay for? Who actually has a right to be in Germany? Because remember, many of the people who've come to Germany, many of them are war refugees from places like Syria, but there's also lots from the Balkans or from North African countries where the, the humanitarian case for asylum is questionable. And so there is a debate still to be had, which Mrs. Merkel doesn't seem very keen on having, about who precisely should be joining this Einwanderungsland, who should be joining this country of immigration. And I think perhaps most of all, there's been a reluctance on behalf of Germany's entire political class to confront the country with the new demands on it on the world stage. And here I would single out this, the SPD for criticism, the party fought a very opportunistic campaign in this election, which tried to portray Mrs. Merkel for merely uh, agreeing with the aspiration of 2% of GDP spending on, uh, on, on defence in line with the NATO targets. He characterised that as making her a poodle of Donald Trump. Um, and I think this willingness to play politics with, with the, the growing demands on Germany, with Germany's responsibilities in the continent of which it's so inextricably a part, I think is, is a concern and needs to change. I mean, I've mentioned the Lithuanian deployment, a, a very an ambitious and forward-looking decision by Germany's political class. 
this is a deployment that, as important as it is in geopolitical terms, is not actually familiar to many Germans. And you only have to look at polls to show that, 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 show that the proportion of Germans that would support military action uh, to defend a fellow NATO member in the event of Russian intervention or interference is lower than in almost any other membership country in the alliance. And so you have a country that's in many ways been prepared for the challenges, for the, for the transition that I've described, but in many ways still has more to do. And I think the best example of that of all, perhaps, is um, the scepticism about the vision set out by Emmanuel Macron. My, my objection is not so much uh, to Germany's doubts about any particular one of his proposals, but the, um, the, the assumption that Europe's doing pretty much OK, thanks. I think it's too easily forgotten in Berlin that... France came not so far from a Le Pen presidency last time and might come quite close again, not to mention concerns about Italy with its election coming up this year. And so it's a country in need of, I think, a bit more strategic thinking. And the test for Jamaica, the test for this new government, is how much does it maintain what Merkel did right or what she's done right and correct for what she's done wrong? How does it prepare Germany for a time after, uh, either after Heilewelt or a, a time when the circumstances of Heilewelt have changed? Um, to just conclude, I think um, the prospects are better domestically than they are in foreign terms. I think the FDP, the Liberals, have uh, rightly been ambitious about digitizing the German economy. Um, Christian Linner, the party's leader, described Germany's current success to me as a prosperity illusion, which I think is a little bit strong, but I think is, it, it, it shows a, a welcome appetite for change and a, an appetite for renewal. I think the Greens have some very bold and interesting ideas about accelerating the shift to green energy, green driven cars in Germany. Um, in, in ending Germany's use of coal, they uh, respond to another rather awkward truth, which is that seven of Europe's ten most polluting power stations are in Germany. So, so there's, there's, there's a lot of positive energy, I think, on the, on the domestic front, not to mention the fact that they, the parties all generally agree on the need to invest more, the need for some, uh, some well-targeted tax cuts. But I think on the world stage, it's, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. The FDP has been extremely sceptical about practically everything Mr Macron has said and have ruled out an awful lot of the, um, uh, the ideas that he's put forward. Um, the uh, Green Party do have to get a lot of their policies past their very extremely pacifist, extremely um, uh, left-wing base, which I think will limit uh, Germany's uh, ability to assert itself militarily in the world. For example, I hear that it's quite likely that Germany's current um, uh, uh, program of arming Peshmerga in Afghanistan might have to, might have to come to an end um, if the Greens uh, end up running the foreign ministry. I don't, think, I don't think it will drastically reduce Germany's role in the world, but I think it will put limits on what, on what it can build onto what it currently does. Um, but you know, we, let's not be too pessimistic. I, th I, think, I think a lot remains to be seen. The, the coalition uh, deal hasn't even been drafted yet, and there are many in Berlin who are hoping to push for a more ambitious agenda for this new government. My final thought is that quite a lot about... Germany's coming years and the extent to which it embraces this transition and manages it successfully uh, has to do with the succession to Mrs. Merkel. I think she won't run for another term as chancellor. And so in the next few years, there will be a new CDU leader, a new CDU chancellor going into the next election in 2021. Germany doesn't have a presidential system. Sometimes we forget that in, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world. But it's amazing how much her style has marked Germany and marked the leadership of Germany and marked the decisions that Germany have has taken over recent years. And so the extent to which the next chancellor combines Mrs Merkel's strengths but also corrects some of her weaknesses <clears throat> will significantly affect the extent to which Germany navigates what I hope I've shown convincingly is an important period of transition for the country. And as a friend to Germany, I, I hope that that's the sort of chancellor that it will get.